Ladies and gentlemen, today is a very special day, and I'm thrilled to have someone who's extraordinary in his profession, someone who really has reached the heights, and I listen to him. I'm a fan. He's so good and so much fun to listen to, and you just can't be in the car without him. You just want to just ride with him home. He's an extraordinary radio legend and an icon radio star. Billboard's Personality of the Year. He has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He was invited by Reagan to the White House. I mean, don't get me started. I got goosebumps already. Ladies and gentlemen, Shotgun Tom Kelly. You worked at KFXM, did you not? Yes, sir. And you worked at KDO. Did Tullis and Hearn own that yeah, then? Yeah, Howard Tullis, yeah. Yeah. And I used to and, see your picture on the, uh, on the survey. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And I worked at Caffey. You worked at Caffey. I did. I worked at Caffey, yeah. And I worked at Casey, and you worked at Casey. God, you worked at the Boss of the Beach Radio? Yeah, wasn't that fun? Oh, wow. Who, who'd you work with over there? Actually, it was a real short time because somebody got out of Vietnam, and I was doing weekends, and I really can't remember. But I got the job, did it for about a month, and then was asked to uh, vacate and went to Caffey. Wow. So I was at Caffey for about a year. Who did you work for at Caffey? Uh, I worked for, well, Dave Conley was the program director. Uh, Dave Conley used to be at Caffey or at Casey. And right. uh, so he got a chance to uh, be program director. I don't know why anybody would want to be program director, but uh, anyway, he did. And so he said, would you go with me? And I said, absolutely. Now, back at uh, KACY, I was Bobby McAllister. I hated that name, man. Uh, Bill Tanner was the program director. Was right, the, right. Yeah, Bill Tanner, yeah. That uh, rings a bell. Yeah, Bill Tanner. Uh, I walked in, and I just came from KYOS in Merced, and uh, fresh out of there with my first-class FCC license. And so anyway, I'm in the lobby, and Bill Tanner says, Hi, Bobby, how are you? And I go, well, my name is Tom. Uh, no, if you're going to work here, you're going to be Bobby McAllister. Oh, God. I hated that. <laughs> yeah, I hated that name. I really did. And uh, so anyway, I was driving to work one day. Dave Conley uh, did the afternoon show. And uh, so I was I was driving to work and uh, I had Dave Conley on. And uh, he goes, hey, coming up next, going to be Bobby Shotgun McAllister. And I go, wow, that dresses that name up. So I became Bobby Shotgun McAllister. And well, you... uh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, I wanted to use my real name. Tom Irwin is what I wanted to use. And so anyway, Dave said, well, if you go to Caffey with me, I'll let you use your real name. And I said, well, I'm on. Let's go. So anyway, uh, we went to Caffey. The general manager met with us and he goes, uh, you know, uh, I like the name Tom, but the name Irwin sounds a little Jewish and I'm Jewish. I'm Jewish too. Yeah. Well, if we could uh, just change the last name, what is your nationality? And I said, well, I'm Irish. Hmm. Irish. How about, uh, how about Tom Kelly? And Dave said, yo, we'll revive the shotgun from shotgun Bo or Sh Bobby Sh shotgun McAllister. And we'll call you shotgun Tom Kelly. Shotgun Tom Kelly was born at Cappy. That's where I, uh, I, I did my first television kid show. Uh, in Bakersfield. That's so uh, cool. K K E R O wanted to, uh, and the independent grocers of Corn, uh, Kern County uh, wanted to have a, a host to do a children's show every Saturday morning on Channel 23, uh, uh, K E R O. And so I got the job and I was on every, every Saturday morning as Nemo the Clown. How did you do it? I saw the makeup and everything. How did you learn how to do all that stuff? I didn't. And I had somebody make the girl. They hired a girl and uh, she was the ringmaster and she made me up every uh, every Saturday morning. I'm sure she didn't like it, but. Uh, <laughs> well, you lived one of my dreams that I never did. I would have loved to do a children's TV show. A lot well, I of did, parallels. I, I did two of them. You, uh, yeah, you won an Emmy for one or two Emmys. Yeah, uh, two Emmys for uh, uh, Words of Poppin', uh, which was out of uh, uh, San Diego and was syndicated across the country. Got on oh. WRTV in Indianapolis, KMGH TV in Denver. And then uh, I was back on KERO 
with words of poppin and those are just some of the stations i remember but uh yeah we did uh, we did five shows every saturday well not every saturday but when when we did record it was five shows we did uh we did uh three in the morning broke for lunch and we did two in the afternoon and each show i had to have a different set of clothes we had a we 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 used an audience and so we had five different audiences every oh. saturday today dirk wool marianne musser and randy david will compete with jenny johnson john four and Kim Spool to win fabulous prizes by playing games involving skill and forming, guessing, and changing words on the show that will stimulate your mind. Words of Poppin'. And now, here's that dynamite host on Words of Poppin', Shasta Tom Kelly. <laughs> everybody welcome to words of pop in the all-american game show where we play games with american words got a couple of teams of players we're going to be competing for some really nice prizes which mike ambrose is going to tell us about later on it's a very challenging game for kids we had three games we use mix of word for the first game uh for the second game it was uh kind of a hangman game like they have on wheel of fortune and then the third game was find a word but you could like if you go to spell cat you had to spell it with the corresponding number so oh. you couldn't you couldn't say c-a-t you would have to say two five four what's that word cat you know got it so, yeah, well it was an educational show that yeah. i think it was pre-sesame street yeah well and... no, no, it was it was after see that's what they wanted to do it was a commercial version of sesame see sesame street wasn't commercial but no. words of pop and was you could sell commercials on on that uh, well, it was a great service to children yeah and then uh after five years i was the booth announcer at kusi tv and i was working at kfmb at the time uh san diego yeah san diego yeah so anyway uh uh the owner uh mike mckinnon uh said hey you know uh you did that kid show over at channel 10 didn't you i said yeah so well, i'm not gonna spend that kind of money but uh uh i bought a cartoon package and i'm gonna start the kusi kids club how about you being the host I go, sure, I'll do it. Oh, he's real happy about the KUSI Kids Club, and so will you be right here on KUSI TV 51 San Diego. <laughs> Keep watching every morning and afternoon for your chance to meet Baby Shamu in person and find out more about our newest member of the KUSI Kids Club right here at SeaWorld. Right, Clyde? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway that show lasted 12 years oh my I, god I, I still get grown adults coming up to me and said shotgun when i came home from school i used to watch you on the kusi kids club and uh, you were always a part of my childhood so um, that's kind of rewarding uh, charlie what a life yeah charlie tuna never liked that you know people would come up to him and say i used to listen to you on 93 khj and they're grown adults and they were they were teenagers when they used to listen to him and uh he used to tell me he just he, he couldn't stand that i i never could understand that because well, it made him feel old probably god bless yeah, him i guess so but i don't care i'm just i don't I'm, care either i'm glad people remember me man that's it and you know i uh have a fan base of guys that are i'm going to be 76 in july 77 sorry thank you but there's a bunch of guys in their early 70s, including Johnny K, who used to listen to me at KFXM and Mike and a number of others who have actually gotten in touch with me and reconnected. And I love it, you know, the idea that they remembered me and found me on Facebook. And I'm privileged to well, do this show. I, I used to, whenever I'm in San Bernardino or going through, I used to listen to you too. And of course, those surveys, uh, you know, with all the jocks, uh that uh, tellus and hern put on you were very prominently displayed oh thank you i really appreciate that i'm a big fan and i'm serious i there's just you know i love radio as i read that you do too and yep. gave my life to it and really focused I, I'm, on I'm, it 
I'm doing my show right now. I st- I paused. I'm doing the Thursday show right here. This is okay. The, this is the microphone we use for serious. Sixties. Yeah, 60s, six. Sixties go no. Sixties gold. Okay, sixties uh, gold. Some some marketing guy at uh, Sirius decided to uh, move us up to the because Elvis is on seventy five, the fifties is on seventy two. Why don't we put instead of the sixties on six? Well, I got a tremendous idea. Shake it off the sixties <laughs> on six. Let's put it on seventy three. <laughs> I get such a kick out of you. You know, you're a real personality. I okay. know that your idols were Wolfman Jack, as mine were, and the real Don Steele, and a, God bless him, and a lot of other people. But you are a real superstar. I mean, who else met a president? What was that like when you met well, President Reagan? Well, that was pretty cool. Uh, uh, my congressman uh, set that up. Uh, he wanted me to be the MC when uh, Reagan came to uh, San Diego. And I said, I'd love to. So I was the MC. I was inter- introducing, we were waiting for the president to get here, introducing Charles and Heston. Uh, uh, and also uh, Robert Stack was there. And uh, uh, Wayne Newton had his whole orchestra there. Wow. And, oh yeah, it was it was quite a big event. That's cool. Uh, so anyway, um, I, I was here, Reagan came in, in backstage. And I, of course, everybody knew he was here and Secret Service is all around. And so anyway, uh, the guy that was from the White House said, Shotgun, thank you so much. Uh, we have a tape to introduce the president. I go, oh, wow. I don't get to introduce him. And you're not going to believe who was on Air Force One with him. Who? And, I, and I'm all, I would have... I would have loved to have met this man along with Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan and Nancy oh. brought, brought Frank Sinatra on Air Force. Oh Force. my gosh. Holy cow. And so uh, I was asked to stand over uh, by the chief of police, who I knew, uh, Bill Collender. I said, Hey, Bill, come on, man. You got to get us backstage, at least backstage. He says, and he had a he had a list because oh see I, I I got no jurisdiction around here. See that guy over there with a the hand in the purse? I said, Yeah. He said he's got his trigger finger on an Uzi. He'll shoot first, ask questions later. <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, uh you're probably wondering, well, you did go to the White House and you were in the Oval Office and you did meet Mr. Reagan, yes. And he wore the hat. And he wore that that is a very how many presidents would put on a, a zero yeah right even kennedy uh when he was in texas they gave him a cowboy hat and he wouldn't put it on if you remember uh, but anyway uh so uh my congressman said where are you get back up on stage i said they told me to get over here he said he said i'll tell you what i'm gonna fix this up you're gonna uh, you're gonna go to the white house we're gonna walk into the oval office and you're gonna give the president one of your hats can you do that I said, sure. So I ordered one from Stetson Hat Company. They had his hat size. And it took a couple of months. And so my uh, my visit for the president was approved. I flew back to D.C. And Duncan Hunter and I went over to uh, the White House. And uh, we were standing outside the Oval Office, ready to see uh, Mr. Reagan. Anyway, uh, we go through that thick, seamless door that we've all seen. And so we walk in, Mr. Reagan is behind the Resolute desk. He gets up from the Resolute desk and he walks over to the shell bookcase. Well, he's been briefed. He knows my name. So he says, well, Shotgun, I understand that you were the MC and kept the people entertained while they're waiting for me in San Diego. And I said, yes, Mr. President, I did. And I bring you this trademark Ranger hat of mine and I hope you'll put it on. He goes, well, put it on, click. That's the picture you see. Fantastic. And it's up on the screen right now. Okay. Uh, it's it's incredible. Um, I don't know any other disc jockey ever that has met a president and twice and now and done what you've done. That's really amazing, amazing story. Well, uh, Elvis met Nixon 
Yeah, but you're the Elvis of DJs, I guess. Okay, that means, yeah. you know. Well, that's that's my uh, my Reagan shot that you just saw. That's I guess that's my Elvis thing, you know. But uh, it's pretty only, cool. Only with the great communicator. You know, and, by the way, by the way, yeah. you're always, you're, you're, when you meet the president, I I was told is going to be a strict five minutes, and they had a camera there recording all this stuff, and so uh, I started talking about broadcasting. Oh, and man. oh, that he just lit up. He says, "Well, you know, uh, uh, shotgun. I used to uh, recreate the uh, bowl games when I was in radio, and uh, we used to take the teletype." and uh, recreate the bank games because the radio station couldn't afford to send the announcers along with the team. You probably don't remember that. I said, well, uh, Mr. President, I absolutely do because in San Diego, they had a couple of guys, Al Shuss and Al Coupe, who used to recreate the Padre games when they were away. So I know, oh, he said, well, you know, from where I speak, I said, yes. So he told me that whole story. Then we started talking about different microphones and and the uh the white house guy was uh you know i got we spent 10 minutes with the president it was it was great and he just couldn't stop talking about radio and 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 the i remember the last words he said to me he says well shotgun uh, you know when i was at paramount pictures uh we had a makeup artist and his name was shotgun i said well that's that's great it was great meeting you Again, thank you uh, for putting on my hat. Thank you, Mr. President. And then we walked out. Um, I saw a video of you on Sirius, and you have no commercials, but you're just super smooth and going through the music and popping in your little one-liners and your sound effects and all your really funny stuff. Is the degree of difficulty higher Whereas working at a station like KR3, you got promos and spots and the news and the weather and the traffic. Is that more difficult? No, no. As a matter of fact, uh, at K Earth when I was there, it was very highly formatted, as you know. And uh, uh, you, you're right. I had traffic. I had the commercials to play. We gave away uh, trips to Hawaii and different things. I had those to record. And so... Uh, it was it was very well formatted. There was a formula there, uh, and there is somewhat of a formula on Sirius XM, uh, '60s Gold Channel 73. Uh, but what I was at K Earth for like 20 years, as you know. Congratulations, uh, by the way. I know I couldn't believe. I mean, can you a radio job for 20 years? Thank you for your service. <laughs> uh, yeah, no kidding. I lucked out, you know. Well, your uh, talent, you know, talent does do some things. And if you're smart and work real hard and you're passionate, I think that's what happens. Congratulations. Well, I'm, I'm, plus, Dan Mason uh, liked me, too, in New York City. So every three years, he would renew my contract. That's nice. Would, it's, help, it's helpful to have the president of CBS Radio like you. So And, and of course, you, per, you performed. Yeah, I, yes, I did. And. And of course, Johnny K, you know, oh, God, what uh, a great guy, terrific. You know, Johnny K was brought in to fire me. What? Yeah. They wanted to get a Hispanic on instead of me. Oh, no. Yeah. So uh, Johnny being a suit, he wouldn't do it. And of course, uh, Dan Mason wouldn't let him do it. So between Dan Mason and Johnny K, uh, I was able to stay. Thank God. Wow. Yeah. That, that would have been, been a, a big mistake. mistake. I, I thought so, too. And so did Johnny. Uh, but uh, that's why I just, I mean, I love him so much, man. And not only was he a great programmer, but he's just uh, just a great guy. Yes. Well, Johnny was influential uh, when I said, uh, I'd kind of like to have the, a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. He said, okay. And he put it into action. And... Uh, so it took three years to get it, but I finally got it. Now, the question was about Sirius XM. I'm, I, I drift off sometimes. Uh, K-Earth was very formulated, and, and you had to do certain things. But what I like about Sirius XM is they give me freedom. I get, look, look, at, look at these emails that 
I mean, these emails that came in and uh, just by regular people and uh, our listeners, I, I say, well, you know, you hear me on, on I probably at nauseum give out, hey, if you want to have a feel good song, got a birthday, got an anniversary, get a hold of me at shotguntomkelly.com. Click on the first picture you come to on that picture. There's the word contact. If you click on that, an email opens up and then write me what you want. So people have done that and I, and I get them over and over again. As a matter of fact, this guy wanted to hear My Way by Frank Sinatra. So I'm going to play that for him. I had a lady from Norway. She liked that. Yeah, she's in Norway, man. And cool. she's, on, she's on vacation and she's in her hotel room listening to the app. It's not the satellite, the app. So they really, uh, that, and if you're in Hawaii, we, our, our satellite doesn't go to Hawaii, but I've had people in Hawaii listen on the app. And uh, it's that app is really great. Well, it's the next step after satellite. It's going to be yeah. streaming on apps, on cell phones everywhere. Yeah, it is. Or your computer. Yep. So you're way ahead of, of the thing. And it's still radio to me. I don't care. You can call it satellite. You can call it streaming. It's radio. So tell me a story about a promotion that you did, something. I know you're involved with a lot of charities. Mm -hmm. And you've raised money and put your name on a lot of charity events and at cause promotions. What's one of your favorite success stories that in your life in radio or satellite that you've done and that you're really most proud of? Well, you know, uh, for 35 years in San Diego, when I was at KCBQ, uh, B100, uh, KFMB, uh, I did the uh, muscular dystrophy telephone. So that's when I was doing the kids show. That's how I started that. I started the kids show in 1974 at KGTV, ABC 10. And so uh, Dick, uh, Dick Alderson was the uh, field director for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. He said, uh, I want you to be our backyard carnival spokesman because Jerry Lewis was really big into clowns. And so uh, uh, at the time, and and so he asked uh, a lot of his hosts, co-hosts, which I was one, to uh, be the backyard carnival host. And I, I would go, these kids would have a send away for a, a carnival kit, and then we'd have their little backyard circus. And Shotgun Tom would, would show up once in a while. You know, I had a list of people that I did uh, every weekend. And uh, we always would go every year to Las Vegas to get our picture taken with Jerry Lewis. Now my picture was uh, featured with him uh, on at all the 7-Eleven stores. It was me and Jerry blown up really big at every 7-Eleven store in San Diego. And uh, so every year, all us telethon hosts and co-hosts would meet in Las Vegas at the Sahara Hotel. And so uh, I think I was five years into the charity. And so uh, I was in the elevator at the Sahara and guess who walks in? Jerry Lewis. Well, this is my opportunity and you're not supposed to talk in the elevator, but I did. And of course. So, so Jerry's got his golf clubs and he just wants to be left alone, I'm quite sure. So I said, uh, Mr. Lewis, you know, we're raising a lot of money in San Diego. And then, so when I got through talking about the charity, uh, I told him about my hobby and I said, you know, uh, I collect outtakes and I've got an outtake of you and Dean Martin doing the caddy. I don't want to hear about it. Don't ever bring that up again. The door opens. He walks out. Bob Ross, what's going on? So anyway, he got really pissed. And so anyway, uh, my wife, Linda, and I are waiting. There's a luncheon meeting, right? And there's Jerry Lewis on the dais. He comes off the dais and he's, he's coming to me. I'm, I'm, I got the ranger out a little, little hard to miss. <laughs> and so he's coming directly at me and I'm saying to Linda, I says, Oh, here comes Jerry Lewis. I met, I pissed him off in the elevator. Uh -oh. He's going to troll me out of here, man. So anyway, now he knew my name and he goes, shotgun. I want to apologize. What happened in the elevator? Uh, please forgive me. And he gave me a big, you, you brought up something 
that uh, were, uh, you know had a very sensitive noise and uh, gave me a big Hollywood hug. And from that point on, he would never forget who I was. So every that year is, after, yeah. So tell me something about radio that uh, surprised you at some time in your life. You said, wow, I can't believe uh, this is happening. Uh, even way back when you started in Merced, uh, when you were 10 years old and you decided you want to be a DJ and got on the air with uh, whoever was doing that remote invited you in and did an interview with you. Oh, you do, you've do. you done your homework, I see. That, that was That was Frank Thompson at KOGO. I was 10 years old. And my mother's a big, my mother's the one that got me into radio. She loved listening to radio. My mother too. And, yeah. She, she's from Nebraska. Her favorite radio station in Nebraska was Coil. Oh, yeah. Big stage. So she moved out here. And uh, so she loved listening to the KOGO because this guy, Frank Thompson, would be in this trailer and uh, he would be doing his show all around San Diego. And and I would follow that trailer around. But I remember I came home from school one day and my mother said, Tommy, there's uh, there's a man. His name is Frank Thompson and he's broadcasting on KOGO and he's putting people on the air. Why don't you go down and see if he'll put you on the air? So I, I said, okay, mom. I had no idea that I wanted to be a, uh, on the air. God bless her. So anyway, yeah, God bless her. So so I got on my bike and I went down there and I, I looked in this trailer and Frank had two turntables and a microphone and he was on the air. And I got to tell you something. I was totally fascinated. Oh, yeah. Absolutely fascinated. So anyway, I'm looking through the window. And he goes, ah, the Frank Thompson show here on the uh, Kogo mobile unit. I see a young man out here. Uh, come on in here, young man. What's your name? Oh, my name is Tom. What school do you go to? <laughs> St. John of the Cross Catholic School. <laughs> well, uh, Tom, I've got four tickets to see the L.A. T-Birds when they come to Westgate Park. So he gave me those tickets. And uh, I, thought he, I thought he gave me a million dollars. But uh, he did. Anyway, I know. <laughs> so I went home and I built my own little radio station in my bedroom with extension speakers. And uh, that's how I uh, hurried myself into this business. And the FCC caught up with you. I heard you oh. had a little uh, pirate radio station going on. That's Tell me right. more. I want to hear have, that story. You've definitely done your homework. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, you don't, you don't mess around, man. You do a little show prep, don't you? Well, this anyway. is serious. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, uh, the extension speakers got boring. I had speakers from my house, the house next door, and the house across the street. And uh, I wanted more than just three listeners. So a friend of mine, <laughs> a friend of mine, uh, Wes Owen, he said, hey, I've got this transmitter that I built on top of a uh, cigar box. What? And Yeah. He, was very, he had all these little components on an upside down cigar box. And then we had this big power supply uh that was not on how old were you um 12 12 13. my god yeah wow go ahead well, i'm anyway, sorry to interrupt you no it's okay i was hanging around kdeo that chelis and hern station and they'd let me go in the production room and uh i'd get to make tapes so we'd get these tapes and we'd run them on our little sony tape recorder and uh, through the transmitter and uh, I may have been 16 because we used to drive around in the car listen. and listen to see how far we got. We were on 840, a Mexican frequency. Yes. We, we were only on at night because if you're on in the daytime, you're going to, you know, get a chance to get busted. So we were only on at night. And uh, so, you know, mom and dad, hey, look at our son. He's staying out of trouble. He's not committing <laughs> local crime. He's committing. They didn't realize I was committing federal crime. Yeah, big time. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I wanted to get out more. So my friend Rick was up on a hill and I, I had the wrong idea. AM doesn't need to be high on a hill, but I, what do I know? So he was high on a hill. So we, uh, uh, and he didn't like to be on the air. He was more of a technical guy. So anyway, I'm uh, I'm uh, in study hall at Mount McGill High School, and I got I'm listening to. I wonder if anybody's on 
840. And, oh, wait a minute. I hear Stevie Wonder. Oh, geez. The Mexicans have taken over the frequency. What am I going to do? Oh, what are we going to do? So anyway, then my voice comes on. It's me. <laughs> Introducing Stevie Wonder on that tape in the middle of the day. Oh, I'm going, oh, geez, this is dangerous. So anyway, I get home. I get a I get a call from Rick. He says, "Hey, the FCC was here, and they they told my mom and dad that uh, I violated the violated the Communications Act of 1934, which is punishable by five year imprisonment and ten thousand dollar fine." The old man was pissed. He went out with a with a sledgehammer and just broke everything up. Ah, oh. yeah. So anyway, they had a hearing. The FCC had a hearing, and they let us off with a warning. But they said, if you're going to be in broadcasting, you have to get a license. And that's when I got my third class license. Shotgun, before you leave, tell us about your Ranger hat. One moment, please. I'll be right back. Okay. Uh, the hat started at KCBQ back in 1970. And uh, no, maybe, no, wait a minute. Maybe, maybe it started at Caffey in Bakersfield. Yeah, that's but I brought it to KCBQ. And people say, um, well, how'd you come up with the hat? Well, you know, we used to go on camping trips to Yosemite and Sequoia. And uh, when I was eight years old, I had a, a hat and I put the dents in it like this. And I have a picture of me standing next to Smokey the Bear with my Smokey the Bear hat. I really admired the Rangers. So I love their hats. So here is a picture that was blown up by the guy who sold me my first transmitter. He's really into, uh, you know, making pictures better. He took a black and white snapshot that had creases in it. And I, I remember the when they had to have the date on there. Yes. You know, and, and I said, Wes, can you, can you blow this up? Can you improve it? Because it was really bad quality. And he's got all these, you know, this computer stuff to improve bad film. He created a big picture of me from that little black and white. Not only did he, he, he went, he actually colorized it. And it looks like this. Thank you, Shotgun Tom Kelly. You are the greatest and I'm thrilled to have had you as my guest. It's a feather in my cap. Oh, and man. Uh, you're a super talent. and one of my favorite people to listen to on the radio. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you for being here. All right.